And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Verse Online, crit... The team behind the team behind Arklands, the Spellforge's comp companion, last time. Now with it, now with a adventure expansion upcoming called the Book of the Graces. The one and only Nick Arklands. How are you? Do how are you doing tonight, man? Oh, very well, Mildred. Very well. It's uh, great to be back on the on the show, and thanks for having us once again to mm -hmm. talk about uh, talk about the Book of the Graces. Yep. So, it has it has certainly been it has certainly been a hot minute. A hot minute since I've ha since I've had you on previously to discuss Arklands. Sure. So what what have you what what sort of trouble have you been into in the interim? Because I can't say that you that you've stayed out of trouble. That's impossible for folks like us. No. Um. Well. Um. So yeah, we we kickstarted um Arklands the Spellforge's companion. Um. We we successfully funded it. We got it out there. Uh, amazingly, during the, a worldwide pandemic, we actually got out there on time, which um, I'm, I was, you know, pinch myself that I was quite surprised that that happened. Um, and uh, we've started to develop quite a nice little community on on, on Discord and, and things like that. So at around kind of September, October time, we thought, right, okay, we we need to sort of start dreaming this all up again and um, working out where we go next. We did a couple of things. So firstly, we um, set up our, uh, a, a lot of content for people. We, we've thought there's so much we couldn't get in the Spellforge's Companion that we just wanted people to have. Because the bigger and the richer the contextual picture that people have, the more they're going to enjoy it. And that's kind of the business we're in, you know. If you're in a role-play game business and you don't, your main focus is isn't that people should enjoy what you're doing then it's it's really <laughs> really are missing the point in quite a major way and we've in the spellforge's companion we uh, mentioned in brief five dimensions of the one that uh, they get the players get to explore initially is part of the mortal realm the first expansion pack we were creating a series basically called the arklands expanded universe um, and the first book is called The Book of the Graces, and it's set in the celestial realm. Um, the, the, di the story of the, the dimensions are essentially this uh, one god, the Keeper, comes along, finds, the, finds this universe um, in total chaos. It's a universe he didn't create, he mm -hmm. just finds it. Find, as you do, you find universes sometimes. Um, and he decides to tidy it up. He takes all the chaotic creatures and flings them down into a place called Damnation. Mm -hmm. And then he creates for himself and his his children, the Graces, they're rather like angels, this place called the Celestial Realm. And that was where things were meant to stay. Um, but the, the Keeper himself has become more and more kind of corrupted. Uh, a terrible monster, a terrible force of destruction, kind of, um, called the devourer comes along and wrecks everything and in the battle to um destroy the devourer the graces uh, are kind of pushed to their very limit and the the keeper begins to become suspicious of some of them uh and creates his own sort of kind of keeper gestapo uh, <laughs> to uh to to kind of uh, murder some and get rid of them he doesn't like and this creates a civil war in heaven. Uh, finally, there's this cataclysmic event called the Sundering, which begins kind of the, the Arklands world, and it's all in the Spellforger's Companion. And uh, heaven is really broken. The, the celestial realm, as it is, is really broken up mm -hmm. as a result of this. The Keeper dies. The light that he creates, this glowing orb, to warm the celestial realm and make it a beautiful heaven, that begins to sort of ebb away. And as a result, we have this, this heaven that is becoming more and more a frozen ruin. Now we thought, okay, if you're going to create a role-play game, which, I mean, the, the, the celestial realm it manifests itself as essentially floating islands and castles in the clouds, as, as you'd sort of imagine a heaven to be. Mm -hmm. 
So what do you do with that? How do you um, manage a party going from island to island? So we thought, well, they need they need some kind of transport. So as a result, we've created a, a new aerial combat mechanic for the, the raptors, which are giant birds which fly around the celestial realm. Um, it was in, in part, um, I always noticed when I was playing the, the, uh, the Star Wars Fantasy Flight Games, um, the recent uh, Star Wars that they, they've done, that there was... Yeah, um, one of the the kind of the inspirations for for what we're doing was the um, Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars. Um, in in that, you know, a huge part of that is, is making sure that the party have access to spaceships and have the skills pretty readily available mm-hmm. to you know move around from planet to planet. Otherwise, it's a, a pretty pointless, boring game. And here we have this um, this fl- sort of floating archipelago of islands and castles in, in the sky, basically, all of which are f- going to rack and ruin. Um, and so we needed a means of getting people around. Um, and something it had to be something slightly beyond a kind of a, a standard mount. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've come up with a uh, what we call the raptor mechanic, um, we've, we've created a, a series of, of giant avians, uh, giant hawks and owls and ravens and swifts mm-hmm. that uh, PCs, uh, each with their own particular special abilities, the PCs can, can fly. Um, the trick was, of course, if you think about how people will, will break the mechanic, not to give somebody a permanent, super powerful kind of uh, air to ground attack weapon uh, that will just sort of hover around and do do their bidding. So it didn't it doesn't quite work like that. We've we're on our a kind of like a, about the second or third iteration of the mechanic at the moment. Um, and one of the one of the great things about playtesting this is people coming back and going, "Yeah, I've broken your system." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. And I used to think that that would annoy me, but it doesn't because I, I love it when someone comes back with a technical challenge. They say, this doesn't make sense. And if I could do this, could I do that? And you think, ah, no, right. Okay, let's go back to the drawing board and fix that problem. Um, so I think it's going to be a pretty, pretty, a pretty fun system to play once we've uh, we find out the, the, the many bugs that always come along with these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, um, we we have created something where there's there's basically fast, snappy aerial combat um, that that has the kind of you know, you would imagine this would have to have a kind of real pace to it. Mm-hmm. Um, the funny thing is, and perhaps you can kind of correct me here, or one of your listeners can. I look back. I tried to find everything I could in the five editions of D and D right to back to the beginning that on um aerial combat rules and i i only ever found one thing and it was in i think it's either three or 3.5 D um 
a, a, a sort of about one page in a Dragonlance supplement um, about kind of manoeuvring on a dragon in the sky. And, um, pretty, mu pretty much. Um, yeah. Largely, largely because and this, and um, admittedly, this is a this is a criticism I've had with D with um D with D with D and D as a whole, um, where it's where it um that I've joke I've jokingly remarked that D and D doesn't know whether to shit or get off the pot when it comes to what sort of fantasy it wants to be. Yeah. Um. And yes, I will freely admit that part of that is just me being a smart ass because well that's <laughs> that's why they pay me that's why they pay me the big bucks. Um, yeah. But the but the more pressing matter in, revealed in that is the is the fact that when you ha when that um not everybody is not ever that eventually people are going to want to do campaigns and ideas that are outside the yeah. um the traditional let's go let's go into a dungeon and t and and um take their stuff kind of thing. Not yeah. that there's anything wrong with that, but, if, but uh, and some people will be able to stick with that and 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 have and be perfectly content with it, but not everybody is going to be wired that way. No, In no. fact, the sole reason why third party game the third third party stuff exists is because not everybody's going to be wired that way. And when it comes to air, when it comes to aerial combat, that has been a very debated topic over the years. Largely because there's not really, there's not really a framework. Not just in D and D, but there's not a whole lot of framework. Um, period. There's I, there's ideas here and there in, in different games, but no. But um, when it comes to, but a lot of t a lot of times it's but a lot of times aerial combat is still a side aspect of traditional combat, or you or it's going full theater of the mind. Yeah, and since you brought up that kind of thing, that does lead me to one um, aspect that I'm cu that I'm curious about, and I ended up asking um, James Streisand about this with his take on aerial combat that he was planning, and that's how you intend to handle dogfighting. It's uh, more well, I'll, I'll say at the moment because uh, obviously we we are betering this out, mm -hmm. but it, it's more structured than theater of the mind it's more um uh more gridded shall we say yeah um uh, uh with with kind of elements of fluidity in it because mm -hmm. of the uh the the the, the dog fighting maneuvers that the raptors actually have so uh as as abilities they can sort of dive or uh turn and make particular uh, do do particular things so mm -hmm. it we, we've tried to um we, we've 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 tried to find a compromise between theater of the mind and st st a structured three-dimensional com uh combat grid in essence um but uh, as i said we there are innumerable bugs in it at the moment that we're mm -hmm. sort of in the in the business of fixing uh so that's uh probably a, an insufficient answer but uh, that's, that's where we are at the moment yeah and i'm not i'm not expecting a full i'm not expecting a full answer to this anytime yeah. soon because like like i said there's because of the fact that there's not really a whole lot of precedent for this kind of thing yeah I am... which is it's I'm, almost one of those kind of slightly troubling things to <laughs> sort of blundered into, really. But you know, uh, look, so, somebody, look, somebody was going to blunder into it eventually. It's a, ma it's not a matter of <laughs> if; it's a matter of when. Yes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think I, th I think we'll make a good uh, a, a good job of it. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it's, it's it's I I was always kind of surprised that with something like Dragonlance, you know, with the, the clues in the title, really. That there there wasn't much more kind of dragon flying, but you know they they have it. Um, I think I think in more as as somebody who's read through his fair share of of the Dragonlance novels, yeah. Um, the the way dragons are are used in that that's 
you're not gonna you're it's not gonna be a common occurrence to have player no. ca- player characters right writing dragons and the like, which um no. no. And I and um I can I can and I had a I had a house rule the hell out of things because I remember um I remember running I think it was, I think it was still running um 3.0 at the, at the time when I did this. Mm-hmm. I want I wanted to do I wanted to do something that was leaning a little bit more in the realm of Panther Dragoon. Yeah. Um even to even to the point where I tried to try to do um I messed around with the alphabet to try and make a fake language to emulate Panzer E's. Um cuz I've been a fan of that I've been a fan of that of that series for a long time. Oh yeah. And obviously with that you're go- you're going to have dr- you're going to have dragons as ba- in the same in the same vein that a fighter pilot might have their pl- might have their plane. And yes, then, that's true. Right. And then of course a few years later we'd get something like Lair, which the game itself is Bork. I'm not I'm not going to deny that. Oh, but yeah. the con the concept of of be, of using a dragon as a mount and and do, and dogfighting the same way you would dogfight with planes yeah. is still fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, I I want to go down the route of a sort of a slightly different avian from dragons because, frankly, dragons have. I mean, after Game of Thrones, dragons are a bit done. I think. Um, they. I mean, we, Dan and Dave you, are still on my book of grudges. <laughs> Well, that, that's right. You know, I mean, I, I sometimes think with dragons, it's a bit like with sort of, say, for example, new Batman movies. I think there just needs to be a 20-year moratorium on any new Batman films because ultimately, what more is there to say? Yeah. Um, that, what more is there to say about dragons at the moment? Somebody needs to go and become a total dragon revisionist and spend about five years reimagining the whole concept and come back with something new um but that's not going to be me um so we 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 went with um with birds instead um because you know they're they're not a a standard fantasy trope are they you know mr tolkien uh (laughs) so but we 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 thought we'd just try to take it in a slightly different uh a different direction um and uh there's, I mean, obviously with, you know, birds, wings, feathers and sort of celestiums and things like that, there's a, there's a certain kind of, kind of synergy of, of, of ideas there um, in, in terms of kind of th- those sorts of tropes. But, uh, but there you go. Mm-hmm. And when it, com- when it comes to... Now, give, given, given the fact that there's a very celestial feel with... With the with um the Book of Graces, yeah. um, one of the things I'm curious I'm curious about is obvious obviously the, now obviously there's been some debate about how superhero-y um fifth edition's rule set can get. Some people find it a bit too superhero-y. Some people find it a bit less so. Yeah. Um, are there it have have there been any um significant changes to the san to D and D's core sandbox that you're that you're planning to accommodate this more, um, this more celestial approach to, to its ca- to a campaign setting. Uh, not really. I mean, obviously, you know the um, the, the the book of the graces is uh, com- compatible with the the version of um, uh, fifth edition. That we've already established in the Spellforger's Companion, with mm-hmm. you know new character origins and uh, classes and things like that. But if you wanted to to take this and uh, run it as a standard fifth edition game, I mean you can do. And and I'd kind you know in some ways you know I'd, obviously I'd love people to uh, play with and uh, enjoy the Arklands world. But if if you want to take this idea and you know tinker with it and weld it into your own standard fifth edition campaign then please please do mm-hmm. uh, there's, there's no there, there, there's no reason why it shouldn't all uh it all all, all work pretty simply um uh but no it's there's there, there's no, there's nothing um fun f- no no fundamental difference there really i sh- i don't think um 
and um, I, I want to, in, in as much as possible, in everything we write, say you know, give, to to give what we do back to GMs, give it back to players, and say, do with this whatever you want to. All right, that that def- that definitely makes sense. Now, when it com- now um when it com- when it comes to the- when it comes to the book, um. Something, something else that something else that I was that I was curious about is, given the fact that you're adding this whole new avenue with airborne um, combat, are are you going to be adding um, cl- classes and s- subclasses to accommodate this? Um, at the moment, the um, the, the classes remain uh, the same. We we will eventually do. A character class expansion. We're gonna we're gonna put in their backgrounds, mm-hmm. which are um, suited to um, uh, the, the, the 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 new aspects of this world. The classes themselves, we're not adding any more of at the moment. We're adding four new character origins um, or races, but obviously, you know, that's such a such a pretty unpleasant word. We don't use that anymore. Um, that are. Um, uh, have their kind of histories and identity within the the celestial realm. Mm-hmm. There's a um, you know gradually as the world as the Arklands world develops, there'll be some sort of transmission of uh, of of these new origins into the mortal realm and vice versa. But they're the kind of creatures that uh, the people of the mortal realm they've never they've never seen them before and wouldn't know what to make of them. Um, and they're they they've, they've they're slightly, we've added a slightly more kind of exotic, if you will, mm-hmm. flavor to these character origins. The slightly more, you know, uh, the the half fae and the half ferg resemble could pass for human, um, and the the corral just about. Whereas we have uh, the Etrushki, for example, which are large stag people, mm-hmm. um, and if those walked into a tavern in in the mortal realm. They're, they're they're probably <laughs> going to cause a bit of a stir. Um, well, if they're so stag people, I'd imagine that, that their horns would get in the way. Well, that's or it. antlers, it? technically, but yes, get... yes. Well, uh, you know, a place to hang your cloak, but uh, they're they're pretty tough, and so would probably beat you up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, we, so we we've kind of gone at it in in uh, in that direction. Um, I, when we eventually look at um, new uh, new ca- new character classes that that will probably be in a, a separate expansion book. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but uh, I haven't even finished this <laughs> this this new expansion book. Before yeah, I'm, I'm not going to have you. Next one. I'm not going to have you count your chickens before they hatch. Just no, yet. no, 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 um, no, no, no. <laughs> but when it com- when it comes to when it, when it comes to when it comes to the the you know origins you already mentioned you already mentioned one of them was half fay the other, and as far as the other one that you said could reasonably pass for <coughs> for a humanoid um tell tell me a bit more about that the in the spellforge's companion we have the the half ferg the yep. ferg are uh giants are about 10 feet tall and they're the craftsmen mm-hmm. of the the Arklands world. They yeah. build ships, they make amazing swords, and they build castles and palaces. Um, but we're always treated by humans in the same way the kind of the, you know, the uh, the plebeians of Rome were treated, kind of uh, not not exactly slaves, but not exactly free. Um, and then they gave the the emperors of the Van Empire. A, big favor once and were allowed to go their separate way but the the the, their their half human children the half ferg who are still pretty huge um some kind of topping seven feet tall uh they are they have some of the the crafting skills of their forebears um and are but they are more rootless and wandering and uh uncertain of their their identity and their their place in the world um and the the way i kind of imagine them are these people who are 
you know, powerful warriors, mm-hmm. but acutely, a- acutely sensitive in a way, acutely sensitive of their role as, as the outsider and their, their, their sort of restlessness that you often find in people journeying for a kind of a, a place where they belong. And um, a half a half a character can quite quite easily become uh, quite a, you know uh, quite offended by the the prospect of feeling they don't they 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 don't quite fit in, uh, which is obviously bad because they're very big and tough. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, big big and tough, big and tough. Who do, who sticks out like a sore thumb? I feel attacked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Big and tough, but like a kind of a hurting child inside, you know. Like that many like many, many big and tough people really are. You know. This uh, is a personal attack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Oh, I'm just uh, I'm just saying I'm just saying that cuz I'm cuz because I have the I'm the poster child of t- of tall people problems. <laughs> I see. I see. I see. Well, Roll yourself up a half fig and and, <laughs> and 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 let me know, um, <laughs> and we will find a place for that yeah. character in the Outlands world where they're accepted and loved yep. and wanted. And, um, you know. For what it's worth, I'm six six. Well, you that is that is that is half fig territory. <laughs> yeah, it. and I've I've um. How is I've, your sword smithing skills? Um, I've don't I've. I've never worked with. I've never worked on a. I've never worked on a forge. I have. I have worn. I have worn plate at least once, and I ha- and I hated it because uh, I was because I was wearing plate in the middle of August. Oh, that's so bad. That's bad. Yeah. yeah. That's, and that's that's stud mail te- temperatures and nothing more. And after that, I had a um, I had an I had an appreciation for, for and for um, for. For Pete, for um, for Pete, for Peter, when he had pl- when he had played um, RoboCop, because he was wearing uh-huh. because that that suit is eight, that suit is like eighty pounds, and he was wearing that in um da- in Dallas in Good the God. in the, in the s- during during su- during the summer. Oh, the poor guy. Yeah, he was lo- and he was uh, he was already a, he was already a pretty skinny guy, and he was losing a pound a day. Crikey! So- <laughs> Crikey! In the service of great art, though, because the first two RoboCop films I always immensely enjoyed, you know, so yeah. Paul, Verho- Paul Verhoeven, what a genius. And the, the funny thing is, when he first got the script, he threw it in the trash. He, because th- he, it, it wasn't, he had, he had to be talked into, he had to be talked into doing the project by his wife. God. Um. <laughs> Someone should have talked Samuel L. Jackson out of doing the sequel. Really, the the uh, the, um, the remake, which is absolutely dreadful. Um, kind of... I think they should have. To- I think they should have talked everybody out of doing that, especially. Yeah. Um, especially, especially the fact that I I usually do- I usually don't make a habit of quoting other critics, but there was one there was one line when it came to the description of the RoboCop suit in that re- in that remake that I felt was too appropriate. I remember. That? I distinctly remember someone writing, "It looks like Batman fucked a Power Ranger." <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm done. I can't. I can't top that. And the I would have. I would have had to say more about it, but I kept being distracted by the by the hands. Like, what's? I can't. I know you're trying to give important exposition, but I'm too. Di- I'm too distracted by the fact that one. E- that you still have one of your hands. Yeah, it's just a, a um, disgrace. Plus the whole stun gun thing. Like, what the fuck were they thinking? Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> bring, anyway, bring bring back Ed two oh nine. Bring back Ed two oh nine. Yeah. Um, the when it com- now when it comes to like when it comes when it comes to um some of the other some of the other um expansion to it through the Book of Graces. I'm get I'm guessing you mentioned origins, but I'm guessing um I'm guessing there's probably going to be a few new backgrounds that you're um, yeah, tossing about. Yeah, yeah, and some very exciting ones as well. Mm-hmm. We began to create uh, the the one that I really like. Well, the two that I really like. The first thing, are a series of essentially the the Knight Templars uh, mm-hmm. called the Hypostics, 
uh, and their role. There's a, a city which is like a giant mausoleum called Dankare, mm-hmm. and the, Hippo- the Hippostic Knights. Their job is to you know to take the as the Templars used to ex- escort pilgrims to the Holy Land. The the Hippostics, their job is to escort essentially the the wealthy and powerful or the dead of the wealthy and powerful to Dankare to be entombed there, um, and the, the Hippostics have wound up. Uh, crossing into the celestial realm to mm-hmm. search out part of part of where their order comes from, but even better than that is, um, I I began to think toy with this idea of a, a monastic order, uh, more of the kind of the the, the friar Tuck than the Bruce Lee variety, um, and I thought you know in the Middle Ages the people who could write were monks and priests. Um, they, you know, that's the, the only books in Christendom that were around were Bibles, and they were written by hand uh, by monks. So I thought, what if monks? Uh, there was a bunch of monks who were cartog- cartographers, and they thought, right, our service to the keeper is to celebrate his work, celebrate his genius. We're going to map everything, mm-hmm. you know, from rivers and mountains um, to human settlements. Um, and then they get to really to the limits of knowledge in the in the world they're in. I think there must be more than this. And they find out that Yeah, so the the Carathene monks um, are the the order in question. They come from a, a monastery at a place called Carath, hence the name the, the Carathenes. Mm-hmm. Um, and as they they after many centuries of cartography, they reach the limits of uh, what's possible to know about the world in which they lived. They began to discover that there were dimensional doors into places like the celestial realm and other dimensions. And when they went up there to the celestial realm, I say up, it's not really up, but when they got to the celestial realm, mm-hmm. they realised that it, not, it wasn't and it had never been the kind of heaven that people in the mortal world had been told it was. For example, it's not where you go when you die. Um, when you die, you just die. Um, and this is obviously something that um, they thought, right, well, we can't tell anybody this. They'll be very upset. And also the fact that the grace is have largely gone they've gone to different places they've sometimes some of them have gone into the celestial the, the mortal realm other graces that are up there uh, are kind of like now like kind of angry post-apocalyptic warlords mm-hmm. uh and the keeper's dead and the whole place has gone to rack and ruin um so if you could imagine s- somebody turning up in our reality saying i've been to heaven and you'll never guess what uh, yeah, it would it wouldn't end well. No. So they they carry the secret around with them, uh, and their their arch enemies, the Scargaline, who are the kind of like the religious Gestapo from the uh, city state of Scaris. And Scaris is a kind of a cross between seventeenth century Puritan England and North Korea, uh, <laughs> kind of operating on that degree of kind of religious uh devotion and kind of piety and poverty and pain mm-hmm. and, and also a, a, like a a paranoid stalinist state that is uh, obsessed with where its civilians are and what they're doing um so the scargaline also find out this truth and the the very underpinnings of of their theocratic state if anybody finds this out are going to be blown sky high. So the, you've got these guys playing uh, the kind of the, a, a great and secret game with one another. Um, mm-hmm. So that's got the, kind of like a, uh, a, a theme that runs throughout the book of, of what 
what you do with this terrible truth, um, which was always true, um, and uh, how it it will affect how people are going to kind of comprehend the world they live in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> that's something slightly slightly beyond your normal dungeon dive, I'd say. Yeah. This t- instead instead of di- instead of diving into di- and get given the given the fact that both of them are basically playing a shadow game with each other, yeah, I could e- I could easily see that as something rife for ex- for exploring when it comes when it comes to them hi- when it comes to them hiring adventures to hiring adventurers yeah. or or other people to um ha- to handle the dirty work. Yeah, I- I'm. So- I say, saying to, saying to somebody who 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 used to be a thief, who is who is just, who is just tired of breaking into places and stealing things. Hey, um, I need you to break into this place and steal some things. Yeah. <laughs> um, either that or or ambushes that that look like an accident. You know the the kind the kind of um the kind of thing that would no, that in ancient Rome would be referred to as the imperial handshake. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. That's right. That's oh. right. So, uh, so yeah, there are, there are a number of the kind of backgrounds like that, mm-hmm. um, and uh, there are a kind of a number of mortal kingdoms that have established themselves in the celestial realm, and they're you know they're trying to make a good go of it, really. Um, but they are they they sort of equate they they have some sort of memory, uh, kind of cultural and social memory of having existed. Uh, or having come from the mortal realm, mm-hmm. but they probably equate to the mortal realm in a way that kind of um, American colonists in the late eighteenth century were equ- relating to England. You know, mm-hmm. in the sort of the seventeen sixties, there were people going, "Well, we we sort of we we sort of Englishmen. That's what we're calling ourselves, but we've never been there, and we don't really have the same." rights as a, an Englishman in kind of Kent or Derbyshire mm-hmm. where we're treated differently um, and this this place called England's actually in many ways a bit of a mystery to us because you know never never been there mm-hmm. uh, but appar- apparently I am one and that's so you get people in the celestial realm who they say well you know my great 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 grandfather came from this place the mortal realm but you know the mortal realm might have exploded by now for all I know mm-hmm um, so again, there's some interesting dynamics there. Yeah, and when it co- give when it comes to when it comes to that, now ob- obviously, obviously, um, given how you mentioned that some that some of the graces are, act more like act more like warlords than than any sort of god or petty god, um, I'm something I'm curious about is what is some of the threats that would be unique to the celestial realm. Well, the 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 at least one of the graces is very much make celestium great again, uh, to borrow <laughs> a phrase. And he he wants mortals gone. You know, um, he's he's building up his forces to do it. Uh, and then there are um, all sorts of kind of problems that have emerged. Uh, dimensional doorways from other places, you know, have, have allowed like na- rather nasty creatures to emerge, uh, and and there's lots of lovely ruins for them to be in, palaces that have um, fallen into rack and ruin, and um, uh, there were some rather there was a rather foolish mage several centuries ago that thought that he could sit on the empty throne of the keeper uh, with his um, uh, with his his black order, uh, and uh, they got. They got trapped by some of the more powerful graces in an endless time loop, and they're there, there, and sort of some have escaped now and are kind of uh, causing all sorts of mischief. Mm-hmm. And then there are the the Shuravai, the Shuravai, particularly nasty um, creatures, uh, humanoids that look like the graces, but but they were created as secret informants. They were created as the kind of like the uh, uh, again, the the, the the keepers' spies mm-hmm. to make sure that the the graces uh, that the keeper was suspicious of were playing ball and uh, doing what the keeper wanted. And now they are. Uh, the, there is a whole bunch of renegade graces after there's a whole civil war type deal. Mm-hmm. Um, 
who have uh, fled the celestial realm and are hiding in the mortal world yeah. and the Sh- the Shuravai are looking for them um, and they have their own helpers now some now um something I'm something I'm curious about now when now um when it came to the mortal realm there was there was a very um a very fertile crescent type of type of feel with uh, with a lot of the a lot of the technology levels and a lot of the sure. um, visual motifs and when it comes to the celestial realm is that is that same level of technology present or would you say it's or you say there's a little bit of Clark's law that's le- that's um, leaking in. Yeah, it's in the celestial realm. What the the, the kind of the levels of, of technology and magic that the Graces themselves had is is more on a you know if you if you were went back in the day when the Graces were running the place, mm-hmm. you're talking more sort of pure high fantasy. But most of that's been the, the Sundering kind of blasted most of that to smithereens and. Some of it's been lost in other dimensions, and you know, uh, the, the humans that have now inhabited this place, a lot of that, the very high level tech is is uh, um, high level sort of uh, super weapons, things like that, is is so beyond their ability to grasp they can't even see them. There might be like a a, a, a Grace's um, super powerful sword lying around, and human beings, it's essentially invisible to human beings. Um, unless, of course, you know, an adventure it, it creates the circumstances by which you can see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so the human beings that have settled in the celestial realm, they live in very nice palaces that the Graces have left behind, but their actual, the technologies they employ are not dissimilar to that which you would find in the mortal realm. Um, some of it looks a bit more aesthetically pleasing, but ultimately... And, and humans, are, I mean, you know, we all know how awful human beings are. Um, what they do, tend to do is they find these beautiful palaces that are kind of like something, you know, beyond our ability to conceive of. And then sort of add rather kind of rubbish bits to them. And uh, sort of, I'll, I'll put a, I'll sort of extend that hallway out by kind of doing some bricklaying. I think no. mm. so, but. That's that's pretty much what I imagine. If human beings found paradise, they do to it. They kind of just start to ruin bits of it. But there you go. Yeah, uh, oh, that's not too cynical a take on on our species. But <laughs> look, if I've, I've after read, I have read enough Russian literature to know that I will never out to know that I will never out cynic that. <laughs> No, because no. you've, pro- you've probably you've probably seen the meme of the um f- of the four co- the four corners of classical literature. I haven't, but do tell um, me. American literature: I will die for freedom. British literature: I will die for honor. French literature: I will die for love. Russian literature: I will die. <laughs> um. And the way you d- the way you describe that sort that sort of tech discrepancy, I could I could easily see a magic item being repurposed as all um, sorts of noises downstairs. My six year old son is uh, kind of starting beginning to protest about what he's been presented with for tea. So I have to get some <laughs> father intervention in in, in a moment. Oh, yeah. um, but it's be- it's been wonderful to catch up again. It really really has. Yeah. Um, and perhaps once we are flying with the book of the graces, we can catch up and have another chat about it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Now, when now um, when do you when do you suppose the um, Kickstarter proper will be will be launching? Right. Well, we're looking in the next seven days now. Right. Um, so I I I will I should keep you posted on that. Yeah. Please please do. And what once the once the page is um set up proper um just just th- just throw it my way so I can I can really di- I can really dive into it. fabulous chatting and um i will catch up with you soon mm-hmm. uh take good care and if there's anything you need from me um um any any other info you need let me let me know i i will do that and i i will i will uh, leave i will leave you to the um inter the intervention <laughs> <laughs> and all right see yep take good care then all the best take, take good care bye bye, bye.
And that will do, that will do it for the, for this particular impromptu um, adventure. And once again, I do want to sincerely I want to give my sincere thanks to Nick for being open to coming back. And we'll pro we'll probably be having a part two of this in due in due time. I'd, ima I'd imagine within a couple of weeks. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!